Hey there, and welcome to the Pseudo Show, brought to you by the Destination Linux Network. In this episode, we'll bring in a special guest, and we'll take a look at managing Linux desktops at scale. Why choose Linux? How do you migrate? How do you train your staff? All that and more on the Pseudo Show. Welcome to the Pseudo Show, your home for all things enterprise open source. We're really excited to continue our conversation around migrating businesses and organizations to open source. I'm Eric, the IT guy, and joining me every episode is my studious co-host, Brandon Johnson. How you doing today, buddy? I'm doing great, Eric. I just got a few new toys. You know, a few weeks ago, I got my uh, Pine phone, been tinkering with that. So much so, I broke the Wi-Fi on it. I can't get the Wi-Fi uh, to reinitialize, so I'm trying to figure that out. I got a Pine tab and I just installed Mobian on that last week. I also got the Helios 64 by uh, Cobol.io and I've been tinkering with that and I'm hoping I'll be able to replace my Synology DS14 with that device or buy a couple more and make a Ceph cluster. How about yourself, Eric? Yeah, man, things are so good. I've been playing hard. Some people call it work but I've been playing hard building some automation around a demo environment here at home. My hope is to be able to spin up vanilla machines with Ansible and LibVirt, then based on my topic for that day, run a playbook that configures that vanilla system into whatever configuration I need it. I've been geeking out because that means I've been able to put my blinders on and play with a couple of my favorite tools, Ansible and GitLab. This episode of the Pseudo Show is brought to you by our amazing partners at DigitalOcean. DigitalOcean recently announced their new app platform service. It is a solution to build modern, cloud-native applications. With App Platform, you can build, deploy, and scale apps and static websites quickly and easily. Simply point to your GitHub repository and let App Platform do all the heavy lifting. It has support for Node.js, Python, Go, PHP, Ruby, static sites, and Docker. DigitalOcean runs their app platform on their own infrastructure, so your costs are significantly lower than other products. Plus, they've built this new app platform on top of DigitalOcean Kubernetes, providing a smoother migration path, so you can take more control of your infrastructure setup. As a listener of the Pseudo Show podcast and a member of the DLN community, you can get started for free. Better than free, because DigitalOcean is giving you $100 credit when you go to do.co slash DLN. Again, go to do.co slash DLN to get started with your $100 free credit on DigitalOcean's new app platform. We want to thank DigitalOcean for sponsoring this episode of the Pseudo Show. On our previous episode, Brandon and I talked about a major Windows to Linux migration he participated years and years and years ago. Yeah, it was 15 years ago. A lot of fun. I still think very highly on that. And I always want to try to do that again somewhere else. We also looked at a couple of examples of migrations that have gone terribly wrong. Today, we, we thought we should bring in an expert on Linux conversions. You may know him as the voice of the Ask Noah Show and co-host of Destination Linux. He's Noah Chalaya, a.k.a. Colonel Linux. Welcome to the Pseudo Show, Noah. How are you doing today? Hey, guys. I'm doing great. Thanks for having me. Yeah, definitely. Before we dive in, I have to brag on you a little bit, Noah. Having, having this group together today is really exciting because for me, you, Noah, and, and, and Brandon were a huge part of me getting involved with the open source community um, and, and especially podcasting. I mean, I went from being a Linux systems administrator, working, working in, in a medium business somewhere to actually getting in, learning the technology, meeting some of the, some of the people that are, are deeply involved in, in everything that goes on in, in the open source world. And, and Noah, you actually, I don't know if you remember this, but a few years ago, you actually sent me some gear to test out and you and I spent some time on video conference, much like we are now tweaking settings and getting things looking right. And, uh, you know, it took us a couple of years, but, you know, got a, a podcast going and I actually met Brandon through the Ask Noah uh, community. And now he and I work together uh, at our day job. So I, I really owe you and Brandon quite a bit. So it's, it's really exciting for me to have you on the show today. I'm excited to be here. Eric and I know you and I know some of our community does, but why don't you tell the uh, folks uh, that listen to the pseudo show just a little uh, bit about yourself? Yeah, for sure. So as you guys said, my name is Noah Chalaya and I own an IT company in Grand Forks, North Dakota. And we are, we're a company of servants. Our mission is to leverage free and open source technology to serve as one body, empowering users with the proper knowledge, tools, and attitude necessary to leverage technology to its full potential. And that's not a brochure filler. It's not just something we throw on the website. 
it's true to the core of everyone that works at our company because we believe that people should own their own technology, own their own data. And we think that the thing that is missing in the world is not that the technology is not there, not that open source can't compete in the same way that proprietary operating systems do or proprietary software does. But we believe that what's missing is just the skills and attitude uh, and tools necessary to leverage that software and use it in your business or for your home. And so uh, since 2009, that's what I've kind of dedicated my professional life to doing is getting people introduced to free and open source software, getting people introduced to Linux as an alternative operating system to Microsoft o uh, Windows or Mac OS. How did you get into technology uh, in, in the first place? I've always been, I've always had a curious nature. Uh, when I was four or five years old, my mother tells this story of me asking her to take the ceiling fan down in her and my dad's bedroom so that I could take it apart. And so in the middle of the day, she's taking the ceiling fan down and I look inside and take the parts out and see what it is that I wanted to play with at four or five years old. But she couldn't figure out how to get all the parts back into the ceiling fan, nor could she figure out how to get the ceiling fan attached back to the ceiling. So when my dad came home from work and asked, why did you take the ceiling fan off of the, off of the bedroom ceiling? And her answer was, because he wanted to play with it. He wanted to see how it worked. He wanted to take it apart. And, and ever since then, I, I've, I've always liked tinkering with stuff. I've always liked playing with stuff. And frankly, Eric and Brandon, it's one of the things that's kind of frustrating to me about today's generation is when I was a kid, I would go into a radio shack and I'd go find a triple five circuit or I'd go get myself a, a pack of resistors and some LEDs and a, and a, and a piezo buzzer and, and a button. And I would build things and I would create things. And I went into a store and looked at technology, not from the standpoint of what can this box thing do for me? It's what can I do with this box? And that's changed. And I think the way that we approach technology has changed. And so my love of tinkering and playing with technology comes from creating and building with technology instead of just being a recipient to whatever some company decides that they want to productize today. Yeah, there's definitely been the shift in our, in our culture from the from the tinker hacker mentality to you know sadly to to the apples of the world where everything comes in a black box and you, you can't look at how it works, you can't make any changes uh, without voiding your warranty or or you know compromising the integrity of the system. Yeah, that's exactly right. If, if I told my grandfather, who was one of the people in my life that encouraged me to play with things and encouraged me to come down into his basement and he would, again, he would set up light bulbs or he'd set up electrical switches and say, here, you know, we can figure out how this works and teach me. If I told him that it's now commonplace for people under the age of 20 to spend $1,000 on a phone that they can't even so much as change the battery in, he'd be rolling over in his grave. You know, getting into technology and that love of tinkering has got you into a, a lot of other uh, fields and hobbies, like uh, podcasting and radio and amateur radio. How, how how does that all fit into the into the picture for you? I I have the conversation. I'd say probably once or twice a year this comes up. Somebody will corner me and they'll say, "Noah, how do how do you get into IT? I want to get into IT." And one of the first questions I'll ask them is, "Why do you want to get into IT?" And I'd say about half the time, maybe a little bit more than that, the answer is something along the lines of, well, I'm in X career and I think that uh, the future of technology looks a little bit brighter and I just I want to be making 150000 a year. And so it seems like that's a good way to go. And I tell every one of those people, don't do it because technology is a is a changing thing we have that the technology that we deal with today is going to be antiquated and, and totally obsolete in five years probably and so it requires someone and it requires a certain level of passion a certain level of curiosity and a, and a certain level of never really being satisfied with what technology can do because as we build we build something we see that it works the more then we try to stabilize it we try to automate it and then we try to scale it I, I guess where, where I have gotten to with that is I wouldn't be where I am today without the people that helped before me and the people that provided that software uh, available to me to play with when I was a kid. And so the Red Hats of the world, the Fedoras of the world, those are the reasons that I'm, I have the position I have today. And it's the reason that my company is where it is today, because I was able to leverage free and open source software to make my business better. And so as as that business has allowed my family and and me to be supported i've tried to give back in the form of uh, of of community content and sharing with other people hey if you want to do this 
if you want to, if, if, if working on open source technology is exciting to you and building relationships with other people who share a passion on doing something a very particular way and getting it done right and, and care about the quality of the code and, and those kinds of things, if that speaks to you, then here's how you can get started. Because the thing that is great about open source that is decidedly not true anywhere else in the technological space is everybody is welcome. It doesn't matter what your background is. It doesn't matter what your socioeconomic status is. It doesn't matter uh, what training you have. There are plenty of people that work at Red Hat and Google and Canonical that don't have advanced degrees. Those people are there because they have valuable skills and because those skills and those relationships that they built online. And I think that's valuable. I like it. And I like, and I, I'm, I feel privileged to be a part of that community. This came up a few weeks ago during during our Ask Me Anything event, and it's it's come up uh, and from time to time. It, it seems to be a re recurring question. I mean, even to the extent that we have 12 and 15 year olds in 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 this audience, I kind of know what I've told them, but I'm I'm curious to, to get your uh, opinion. What would you take someone who's who's in high school who does have that that tinkerer mentality? What what would you tell them to help them get started to encourage them forward? Everybody who has any interest in technology whatsoever, my first advice is either take a programming course, whether it's online or you, you buy like Python in a day, or you take one through your high school or through your college. But really understanding what the commands do and what the software is doing, if you decide to go into system administration, it will make you a better, better system administrator. If you decide to go into software development, it certainly will make you a better software developer. It doesn't matter what you're doing or what application you want, you want to exist in, in that technology space. I, I think what's important is that you start to gain an understanding of the inner mechanics of how that technology works. And I can't think of a better way to do that than understanding how software is written and understanding good software practices, because a lot of those translate outside of just software development. I can tell in, in our IT company, I can tell immediately the difference between the people who have taken a programming course and kind of have their heads wrapped around how computers process information and those that have it. And so it doesn't matter where you are in your career, doesn't matter what your goals are, you should have some basic idea of software development workflows, if only to get experience with tools like GitLab. You know, as as you were talking, this this thought had, had just occurred to me. You know, the consumer mentality that we see, where we've gone from basically building your own hardware components at home to to a black box that costs a thousand dollars, we're we're seeing the same happen at an even bigger scale in and the uh, in the IT industry itself. We we've gone from this mentality of host it yourself, own it yourself, run it yourself to how can I go out and spend hundreds of thousands of dollars a year with XYZ cloud provider so that they abstract all this other stuff away, let them handle all the work and, and take away the profits, the experience, because you're paying them to handle more and more of that versus having the knowledge and the experience of knowing how that system works inside and out. The motivation behind running things locally was never so much about owning the data so much as it was uh, a function of cost. I still, when we deal with companies that are transitioning that don't have managed email services, for example, it's still a sell to get them to sign up and say, well, you're going to pay per user per month. And that's kind of a shock to their, their core, you know, because it's different from the way that they've done it in the past. Mm -hmm. And I think the companies that are that have moved that direction, I think certainly users are moving that direction. Definitely users under the age of 20 are moving that direction. They prefer to consume things as a service. And it's and again, I don't know for them, it's so much not so much about they want to own the data or they don't want to own the data. I don't think it really crosses their mind. I think for the most part, it allows them to obfuscate the actual IT infrastructure and instead just look at it as, well, I need email, so I pay $9 a month to G Suite and I need calendaring. So that is graciously included by Google's good nature in G Suite. And I need some online file storage and golly gee, Google includes that too. This is great. And I think people kind of fall into that trap. I don't think they're making a conscious decision of keeping their data or not keeping their data. So it's, it's so you would think it's a it's a function of not realizing that there's an alternative. The the only way to live their right. life is with this with this cloud subscription. Yeah, exactly. I think that there's a lot of people out there that opt for the convenience button every time. And I, and I don't say that to be disparaging because I have a couple of subscriptions myself. I only say that to say that if we exist in the system administration space, if we exist in the DevOps space, we should be keenly aware of the direction the industry is going. 
and the industry decidedly is the people who understand and know how to manage containers and the companies that build the infrastructure to manage the containers. Those are the people that are going to have the job providing all of the services that people will then consume for a low monthly fee. I think we've seen which direction the industry is going to go. If that's going to, if that's again going to follow the proprietary nature, or if this time around people are asking those questions because we've because of what's come out about platforms like Facebook and and platforms like Ring and and so on and so forth. I think as some of those data concerns and privacy concerns do surface, I think it will make people question a, a second time. And so as we make this transition from we own it all on the device back to the cloud and people just have services. I think it's going to be a really interesting time. Will will people wind up on the Office 365s and the G Suites of the world, or will they wind up on the Proton Mails and the next clouds of the world? Yeah, that was kind of the you know the direction that when I worked on the uh, on that project that we talked about last week with uh, migrating from Windows to Linux. Like, what's going to win? Like at the time, it could. I actually really do feel it could have gone either way from uh, not just on the enterprise side, but also on the consumer side. Uh, could have got Linux could have won, but it didn't for various reasons and didn't gain traction because the industry related tools didn't quite work on Linux. Yeah. And, you know, kind of gets us in, into this, uh, you know, into the meat of this, you do this day in, day out. You know, this is something I don't do that much anymore, but you, you help clients move to Linux, whether that's either, you know, virtualizing Windows on top of Linux or moving them from Windows to Linux. So far, what has been the biggest barrier to a successful transition? And I also, I think that, that we can tie that back into, into that, into the conversation of who could win the, these uh, service wars. That's a great question. I try to always frame the conversation to the client around solving problems, because here's the truth. It doesn't matter if we install Red Hat Enterprise Linux, Fedora, Windows 10, Windows 7, Windows XP, Mac OS, doesn't matter. One thing will remain true, and that's that there are going to be some problems that we have to solve. On Windows 10, it's going to be things like cryptoware and malware. It's going to be things like the automatic updating and restarting and no way to disable that. Uh, it's going to be Outlook crashing because the PST file just gets to some arbitrary uh, size that Microsoft hadn't anticipated and it just breaks. Um, those are the kind of issues that you're going to deal with with Windows. But on the same time, at the same time, we have issues on any given open source Linux desktop. And so I try to be really honest and frank with clients um, when we sit down and, and talk with them. And that, actually, it's, it's interesting you bring this up because right now we're going through this with the company. Company has a mission critical workflow. And their workflow really uh, amounts to they have to get access to a very specific, very tailored Windows 7 box. And they ask for the most reliable way to do that. Well, when you're looking at just remote controlling a computer, really what you want from that remote end is first and foremost, rock solid reliability. Every time I push the power button, I want the computer to boot up. Don't want any problems with the file system. I certainly don't want any sort of networking issues. And when you start to identify those, Linux all of a sudden starts to check a lot of boxes. Large companies are doing this, right? Amazon is going this route. Google is going this route. And so a lot of, a lot of, a lot of major companies have figured out that letting Linux run on the bare metal is where we get the best performance and the most reliability. And then it becomes, how do we get software compatibility on top? And there's a couple different ways to approach that. Of course, the first and, uh, and most surefire way is try to use products and services that run inside of a web browser, um, which is getting easier to do because, in fact, it is indeed what a lot of companies and clients want. When that can't be done, as you alluded to, one of the other really nice, clean ways that you can maintain a Windows workflow but exist on a Linux environment is you can simply virtualize Windows. And virtualizing Windows gets us a couple of things. First is we gain snapshots because now we're hosted on, let's say, for example, a little D instance. And I have the ability to roll back to snapshots. So now malware becomes a, goes from a, well, we have to reinstall and, and wipe all these machines to we just roll back to an earlier snapshot. Secondly, it also means that the workstation, the virtual workstation can be one, delivered anywhere to no longer is it geographically tied to wherever it is the machine is hosted. But also it means when we upgrade the virtualization infrastructure, everybody's computer gets an upgrade because now that new processor translates to everybody's workflow and experience of that new graphics card it translates to everybody's experience, so on and so forth, right? 
And so you centralize a lot of your infrastructure, you contain a lot of your costs that way, and, and you gain a tremendous amount of flexibility. And so as a system administrator, I like it because being on site or being 5,000 miles away is really kind of relevant because at the end of the day, it's just a cockpit. It's a VPN, open VPN connection and a cockpit window. That's console access to that Windows infrastructure. So I, I try, we, we lay all of those things out and we give the benefits to the client and say, here's why this is a better solution. This is how we run our machines at Speed Technologies and it seems to work well for us. Here are some of the things that you can expect to run into. But on average, what we found is the vast majority of people that give it a shot decide that that's an overall better decision for their business than trying to fight the problems that Windows 10 has. And that's going to depend on the type of deployment, the type of software used, the size of the deployment, right? When you're provisioning 70,000 machines, let me tell you, plugging a flash drive in, a Windows 10 flash <laughs> drive in, and just booting the computer up and letting it show up on the domain, all the folders are mapped. Like, that's a nice functionality. It's a nice feature. Windows does that well. Again, if you look at where the jobs are in Microsoft and where the value is in Microsoft, really their value is based on Linux, providing containerized services that run stable and securely uh, up on the internet. And so they're going to need people who understand Linux and care and are passionate about Linux to provide that infrastructure to everybody else who wants to pay a flat fee. Typically, like one of the things, uh, one of the approaches that we talked about last week was implementing Linux infrastructure, like specifically Linux desktops, and transitioning customers to that or end users. In, in my example, taking either virtualizing Windows software or putting it in Wine, like that was one of the ways we did that. 15 years ago, was putting Microsoft Office into Wine for better or for worse. I know you're. I was pretty focused on Windows virtual desktops. How do you get uh, customers to transition to Linux? I know that's a very loaded question. A lot of people, we we because we're geeks, instantly look at the desktop environment and like, oh my gosh, that's Ubuntu and it has KDE desktop environment. We care about that stuff, but normal people don't, right? And so what you find is that you'll walk in and they just know that that's their computer. And Windows Vista, Windows 7, Windows Me, Windows XP, Windows 10, it's all just the computer to them, right? Except Apple. Apple kind of has its own separate little following. But when we go into when we go into an environment, there's been multiple occasions where we'll sit down where the decision maker who's in charge of the company is not necessarily the person that has to use this stuff on a day to day basis, right? So they'll come in, they'll make a decision. Yeah, we're gonna go. Yeah, we're going. We're gonna go with the site to your recommendation. Switch everyone over, and then Monday rolls around, people show up, and buttons are not where they expect them, and everything looks a little different. Here's what you. Here's what we have found after ten years of doing this. The reality is most people gravitate towards looking for the icon that lets them get in to whatever computer resource they want to get into. And so for most people, Chrome and Firefox gets them 85% of the way there. And they can pretty much figure it out after that. Office Suite, that probably counts for another 10%. Where you run into problems, and you pointed this out, there are just some applications that are not going to work on Linux. And the way that we address that, we address it straight up, is we will tell people, identify what the task is you're trying to achieve and then let us help you find the best tool for that task. Oftentimes, what you'll find is that the free and open source software that's available on Linux will work better than the proprietary software that they were using. And I'm not saying that's the case up and down the board. I get it. If you have a, a subscription to something like um, the Adobe Creative Suite, right? I don't know that there's anything on Linux today that's going to be a one-to-one -one com comparison to what you get with the Adobe Creative Suite. However, most people are not spending thousands and thousands of dollars on software. In fact, there's many organizations that have people that they just go on Google and they Google free video editor, free photo editor, free whatever. And whatever the first thing that happens to come up, that's what they learn how to use. I submit to, to those companies and to you if you're listening that a better way to approach that problem is to go and say, okay, I want to edit video or I want to compose Word documents or publish or whatever it is that you want to do. And look at what the open source tool is that's available and see if that tool fits your needs. Because most of what people think they're attached to is actually just a workflow, a comfortable workflow that they understand and recognize. And so if you can create those workflows that you understand and recognize in any piece of software, then you have the ability to work from anywhere. And never was this more true than when I visited System76. And we went to do an on-location broadcast from that place. And of course, as anybody that listens to, to, to my show knows, I don't have any Windows computers. I don't have any Macs. They're all Linux. 
Um, but what, what is nice about using a complete top to bottom free and open source software stack was when I got to System76 and didn't have the computer that I needed to do the broadcast, uh, we just repurposed one of theirs and connected to the internet and uh, opened up a shell and started downloading my software. And about halfway through, it occurred to me that if my workflow were anywhere it was, was anyone else's, it would require going to Best Buy and purchasing probably a thousand dollar computer. Plus, we'd have to load all of the software and contact the software manufacturers to get all of the licensing and so on and so forth. And it, it just occurs to me that none of that was my problem. On the other side, I had issues getting our Blackmagic capture card to work, right? And so though that, that was a challenge that, that I had to face. So, uh, and, and again, so I always come back to, it depends on what problems you want to solve. But my, if I was to condense it down, the, the short version is what we try to do is get people comfortable with the software on the operating system that, they, that they've already been using and learn some of those tools on the operating system that they've already been using. And then under, now that we understand what their workflow is and what tools they're going to gravitate towards or reach for, we try to make those accessible as possible. That was one of the things that was a big challenge. But one of the things that we did at that organization was making sure that end user data was easily accessible. And I think it's uh, 15 years ago, there, you had very limited options. Today, you're stumbling over things like Dropbox, Google Drive, C File, NextCloud. The tool I had to work with was iFolder. And just to reiterate, iFolder was an open source project uh, that did file syncing 15 years ago. And uh, what was great about it was being able to make sure that the experience of that date of getting their data was the same on Linux as it was on Windows as it was on Mac. Ensuring that the customer has a very familiar workflow and data is one of the is just a good example of that. Mm -hmm. So Noah, like uh, you know, kind of like on the technology side, we've talked about like the business side. Like uh, as part of this retrospective, I talked about how I'd approach this today, and one of the one of the things I was definitely thinking about was software management, delivering patches mm -hmm. to the to these desk to these Linux desktops or to the virtual desktop infrastructure. How? Uh, how does Alta Speed handle that? Like that's uh, uh, something that we don't talk about a lot. I mean, we t we talk like yeah, just do an app uh, apt update or yum update, whatever. But you st uh, for many customers, you need to be able to manage that in a very specific way, especially if you need to report on it if they're in a, a regulated industry. Absolutely. It's it's going to depend a, a certain amount on the size. Smaller organizations, typically, we will either have a an established workflow for them to go through to keep their stuff up to date. Um, if they don't want to pay us uh, 75 bucks an hour just to, like you say, to remote in and, and, and run an update. If, if they are a managed client, though, and they come to us and say, listen, we don't, you know, some people say, I don't want to have to think about my business and I don't want to ever have to call you. I just never want it to break. So you tell me a flat fee, I'll pay that flat fee. And uh, you just make sure my IT infrastructure works. Um, in that environment, um, we typically will use something like Puppet to keep to to do uh, to do mass updates. And the idea there is a couple of things. First of all, once you establish a workflow, once you go through and you say, okay, we've set up a, a given service, we've tested it, it works with all of the environment variables that it needs to. First thing we do is is create a backup, preferably an image of that drive. We actually will clone Zilla the drive or something like that to make sure um, that we can roll back to that exact spot, even on the physical hardware. Then past that, we will either have, if there's on-site backup, if it, again, depending on the size, if it's a large enough facility, they'll usually have an on-site backup, off-site backup. And then if they're large enough, we will sometimes host a third backup at our location. And the idea is even if our managed our managed infrastructure clients, even if one of them burned to the ground, uh, the very next day, we could have them back up and running because what we would do is simply move those QCOW2 images that have been backed up over the night. Uh, we'd move those to one of our spare hypervisors, cold, sh cold shelf hypervisors, and, and power them back up. And then it would take a little bit to get some IP addresses and some DNS stuff set up, but they, we'd have their infrastructure back within a few hours. Again, and this was assuming their building burned completely to the ground, there was nothing left. Those kinds of things, uh, I think, is the, is the way we go about doing that. The specific tool is either Bash Scripts or Puppet, but the process, I think, is is what's more important. There's a number of different tools that you can use for, for backup and recovery, especially in, in the age of, of ZFS and ButterFS. The, the process of going through and setting things up 
first by hand, understanding how that process works, making sure that it's a, a tried and true process and making sure that it works in that client's environment. One of the things that we see when we do cleanup jobs, we come up, come in after another organization has been there. One of the things that we'll see is, especially with large organizations, they try to do a one size fits all template and say, here's it's the same IP scheme and it's the same server and it's the same thing. And so they try to use these templated things. Um, they work to a degree, but you need to verify that there's actually data on the other end. I, I don't remember where it was. It was either on Ask Noah or it was on Destination Linux, but we were having a discussion. That was with Alan Jude. Uh, him and I were, were discussing backups. He had a client that actually had a backup complete. They went to recover the data because they needed it, and it turned out it was backing up sim links rather than the actual data. Uh, and that just, again, it underscores the importance of going back and actually checking that the data has, has successfully backed up. An untested backup is uh, not a backup at all. It's almost worse. Yep. It's almost worse because right. it gives you a false sense of security. You know, going back to the business, I'm sure you get tons of feedback. And like, I know you have the same mantra that I had when I was an independent contractor to build creative solutions around open source uh, that are lower cost and have a fantastic, you know, and great return of investment for for my clients. That, I mean, I know that's your the same mantra that AltaSpeed has. What what kind of feedback and what kind of return on investments do your do your clients typically see? When I when I was doing this, it was sometimes it was there was no ROI, like that maybe it was like pennies, but they were having a better experience. Like the, there was an untangible, uh, no, there was no no real savings, but their experience improved. Yeah, yeah. So if you want the largest dollar sign improvement on your on your IT infrastructure, the first the first thing you should do is virtualize. Um, virtualization offers so many advantages, and there are so few disadvantages that it, it, it's really hard to make a case not to do it. The last server that we deployed, most of the virtual servers that we we deploy are from Dell. Various different manufacturers may may vary, but uh, with Dell anyway, there are, there's almost no single component inside of the the server that can fail and take it offline. Redundant power supplies, multiple RAM, redundant storage, redundant. I mean, everything is. It, it's essentially they build those things in sets of two almost. When you look at the cost of, uh, of an entry-level VM, let's say for a small office, 10 to 15 user office, you're probably looking at purchasing that server for, I'm guessing, somewhere between ten dollars and $15,000, depending on how you want it set up. Now, at first you say to yourself, my gosh, $15,000 for a single server, that's crazy. But then you start thinking, well, if I was to go and put Optiplex i5s, latest gen i5s in, and let's say we did eight gigs of RAM, you're probably looking at about $1,000 per workstation to begin with. So you do 10 to 15 users anywhere between 10 and $15,000. However, with the virtualized solution, Linux and KVM is so close to bare metal performance, not quite, but so close to bare metal performance that most people don't notice the difference between installing an operating system virtualized or installing it bare on the metal. Because you're not going to pay anything directly for the virtualization software, unless of course you tack on Red Hat support, then the cost of the virtualization is, is effectively just the cost of the server. Additionally, it means that you can use everything from a $35 Raspberry Pi all the way up to repurposing the existing workstations that you have to access that virtual infrastructure. So the physical things that sit inside of in front of people. And what, so what we tell clients to do is go invest in really good monitors. Go invest in really good keyboards and mice and comfortable chairs and good desks. Worry about that stuff because those things are going to deliver a better experience to your end users, let the let Linux and let the technology take care of chopping up the horsepower. There's very few people that can actually tax a modern desktop to its limits. And now there are some users, right? And half of them are half of them are the people that have 5,000 tabs in Chrome open, and the other half are you know graphic designers or or CAD or something like that. And certainly there are use cases where just having physical metal makes sense. Um, but the vast majority of businesses can virtualize and save a tremendous amount of money. So in addition to just the workstations, because I've spent 15000 so we're basically on par, but we're not really ahead of the game, right? Once we start adding in things like we can we can virtualize PF sets, so now you're not buying it. Now you're not buying a dedicated gateway or a dedicated um, Fortinet or something like that, right? That just becomes another virtual machine inside of your your infrastructure. Uh, you can you can virtualize a file server and have that again as part of your infrastructure. You can virtualize your PBX and have three CX running, and so all of a sudden I've now taken what was a contractor for a phone company and he had to come in and install his equipment and an IT contractor that put a file server in and, and another 
contractor that put in a security gateway and another contractor that came in and installed 15 computers. And I've condensed all of that down into a single to you box that's highly redundant plugs in. And if it still makes you nervous, we can put a second one in. You'll have, uh, you'll have a totally second redundant system. Oftentimes when we're doing a second system, we can split out the storage and we can actually cut the cost down a little bit. So it's not, you know, $30,000 to do too. The more you, the more you expand that infrastructure out, the cheaper it gets. But it doesn't take very long, certainly within a year, that you're, where your break-even point is and you start to see that return on investment. There are other things that you can do that increase the quality of, the, of, the, uh, of, of a user's experience and may not necessarily offer a massive return on investment. So for an example of that might be you could spend, I think the current rate right now is like 12 bucks per month for like an Office 365 subscription, you take that you can take that same twelve dollars a month and put it towards something like a hosted Nextcloud's instance and a hosted Matrix instance, and you can combine. Or actually, you could do it all with Nextcloud. The cloud now supports Nextcloud Talk, and so you can get a very similar service set. Um, the only difference is you're going to pay that money to a hosting company to provide you that service, and you have a choice of which hosting company you go to. So if they don't treat you well you can leave that hosting company and go to another one. Whereas with Office 365, they had an outage a few months ago, got a call from a client, said we can't get to our email. We opened a ticket with Microsoft. They said, yeah, sorry, it's down. We'll let you know when it's up. That was their answer for like 14 hours. People just didn't have access to email. You're not going to have that kind of experience with an open source provider because that open, you, you could leave. And so I think it's, I think it's better for users. I think it's better for the technology ecosystem. And I think it does offer a higher return on investment. Yeah, I kind of want to tie it back to the to the subscriptions. Like a good experience being able to leave. One of the problems that I, that that I've seen is uh, people not owning something as uh, like owning their MX record. There are now so mm. few companies that own their MX record. Their MX record is just a pointer to Google or to Microsoft. I mean, I know it's a pain to manage your own email in any way, shape, or form. But just funneling it, owning your MX record and then funneling your email in the G Suite or the the Microsoft Office gives you so much control. And so if you go, you know what? Google's not treating me right. You just go, nope, I'm going over to Microsoft. And you can ease the transition. That's one one of the things I've thought about lately a a lot because no no one seems to own pieces of infrastructure that that everyone used to care about. And it's impossible to leave. Like it's really, or no, or just really hard. I mean, not impossible. It's just really hard to leave, or really expensive. How have you helped customers get off of Office three sixty five? Or uh, if you have, I mean, it's tough. I mean, it's it's one of the. Uh, I I, yeah. I I can't think of a way of doing it. Customers that get into that after you know after they've moved off Exchange to Office three sixty five, switching to G Suite or switching to Proton Mail is got to be really tough. Maybe once or twice we've had success in migrating people off of G Suite or Office three sixty five. Here's the here's the sad and honest but honest truth is that the vast majority of people that have G Suite like it. The vast majority of people that have Office three sixty five like it when it works. <laughs> Looking at alternatives, this is why I make it such a priority to stay in contact with Dr. Andy Yen over at Proton Mail. Because what Andy is and his team at Proton Mail are doing are creating a service that fundamentally offers the same thing that Office 365 and G Suite does. And that is that you just pay a monthly fee and you get a thing and you don't have to worry about it. And it offers that same convenience, except the big key difference is in the case of Proton Mail, the users control their data and the, the information is encrypted with the user's key. And so as you know, the, the last piece of that puzzle, which is rolling out later this year, is Proton Drive. And once that happens, we'll be able to at least have an apples to apples comparison. Up until now, there's been no way for me to go into a business and really pitch it because essentially what it's been is here's what we would do for email, here's what we do with file sync, here's what we do with messaging, here's what we do with, you know cloud document editing. And those are three or four different solutions that we have come in and stitched together. Now that works, but it's not as cohesive and it doesn't provide as seamless of an environment as something like Office 365 or G Suite. And so the thing that is nice about ProtonMail is it does provide the exact same experience 
Uh, we ha- don't know what the pricing is, final pricing for Proton Drive, so we don't know for sure w- what that's going to look like. And obviously, Google is very aggressive with the way they price um, G Suite. And so, I, but I hope that Proton Mail offers us another option to, to to go to people and say, "Hey, here's why you should care about where the email that hits your organization, where that's going, and why you shouldn't just be a forward to to, to Google." Proton Mail hasn't released hasn't released their drive yet, but do you think there's a market uh, somewhere? For- let, let me try with an example. So with, with myself, I started moving off of subscription services as much as I could a few years ago. And, and it's, it's difficult. And it was complicated by the fact that I would host it on my own system here at home. Inevitably, something would break. You know, the, the media server would go down at 7 o'clock in the evening. When I'm done with, I'm done with my systems administrator hat, I, I just want to sit down and watch a movie. Now it's my job to, to fix that. But on the other hand, you have all these proprietary cloud-based subscription services that you basically pay a ransom to every month to get your services. Do you think there's uh, room in the market for for someone in between, someone who I can call who manages my next cloud instance, whatever the case may be? Do you think there's room in the market for, for a middle ground, someone who uses those open source solutions but gets my money instead of some big corporation that uh, puts a proprietary license on all of their all their code? Yeah, I think, you know, I had a guy ask me one time at a Linux Fest, he was creating a distro and he asked me, how do I get people to use my distro or like my distro? And it was, it was, it was very difficult for me because he's asking the wrong question. The question isn't, how do I get people to use my distro? The question he should be asking is, how can I make a distro that people want to use? And people don't ask that question because, frankly, in our society, we've just become too self-absorbed. But here's the way that people choose the middleman with the with the open source solution instead of the big name, the big brand, is that they get the same consistent solution they were seeking after with the big brand, but they get it with a better customer experience. Most people will go to McDonald's or Burger King or Wendy's not because that is their that is their absolute favorite hamburger and they know for sure that that burger is better than any other burger at the town that they happen to be visiting. No, they go to McDonald's because they know what to expect from McDonald's and they don't know what they're going to get from Joe's Burger, right? It's a, it's something different. Same mm-hmm. thing is true in same thing is true in business. People want to do business with places that they trust, with places that they they have expectations. And the only companies that have been able to deliver a consistent positive experience are large companies that have massive resources. But large companies that have massive resources also can't respond very quickly to change. This is where I think the the most valuable place for IT companies, just individuals, you know, contractor, system administrators to, to be is in those places where if you serve enough people well and you help those people get what they want in life, they will help you get what you want in life because they will reward you with gratitude that we call dollars, right? And that has been that I, I have seen that play out over and over and over again. And when I sit down with new salespeople at AltaSpeed, a lot of them have experience with major national brands and they've... Uh, We've, we've gotten a couple people that have sold for uh, cell phone stores and they have a very interesting way that they approach selling and there's nothing wrong with it. It's fine if that's the way you want to sell things. But we always tell people to concentrate on what our clients need and then find a way to be a servant to that client and serve them in the best way possible. And when you focus your attention that way, instead of trying to focus on money or make the upsell or make the sale or close the deal or whatever the, whatever the quote unquote proper businessy way to do it that I don't do it that way is, whatever that way is, uh, we don't do it like that. Instead, we come across, we take problems as if they were our own problems, as if it was something that was affecting our wives or, or, or our families. And we come into that client and say, okay, how do we fix that for you? I've never felt, or I've never seen that I need to sell that. It seems as though when we go into a business and do that, and if you own a business or if you work in that environment, if you treat people like that, you will have people bending over backwards to do business with you over large brand names. And I have, I can't tell you the name, but we have, there's a large uh, national brand and there's a, there's a local owner that owns all of the stores in the Midwest. And every one of those stores, even though the big national brand has a mandate that they have to have a, a router, a gateway, so the whole nine yards provided by a third-party ma- national company that contracts with this major national brand, inside of all their stores, all of those routers are connected to the internet and they all have an IP address and they show online and all that stuff, but they're not actually running anything. They're all sitting in a cabinet because it got to a point where they went down on a Thursday called a major national brand, said, this is down. They said, yep, we're going to overnight you another one. We'll ship it on Friday. You'll have it by Monday. And the business owner called me and said, I can't not run my business for four days while we wait for this part to get here. Do you have a part? And I said, yes, I do. I can have it in there in 20 minutes. And the part went in there in 20 minutes and he hasn't looked back since. 
uh, you can earn business. It just takes work and it takes scratching and clawing. And you have to be willing to knock on someone's door and say, hey, I know you have somebody doing this for you, but I can do it better for a better price. You have to be willing to take the initiative and you have to be willing to assert yourself. But if you're willing to do those things and you're willing to give people a fair price, treat people reasonably and, and do a good job. Yeah, I absolutely think there's tons of room for people to offer offer these services. And the great thing about it is there's the, the people that are developing this software the people that develop C file and Nextcloud and, and and Fedora, these are people that are doing it because they're passionate about developing that software. And so if you're passionate about installing it and maintaining it for people, now that's a winning business recipe that Microsoft and Apple are going to have a hard time competing with. I couldn't agree more. I, I you're just drop the mic. You know, we always do a call to action on the show. Noah and his team are doing amazing things in open source, things like Linux Delta. Can you explain the need, what you saw when you created Linux Delta, what need you saw? Yeah, for sure. Obviously, when people need IT support or when they need, when when they're looking for paid services, we have, you know, AltaSpeed has a website and all those kinds of things. But one of the things that we found was when you go to purchase a camera or you go to purchase a backpack, one of the most valuable sites that you have access to is a play, is an, is a shopping site like Amazon. Uh, for technology, uh, for production gear, it, that probably is a place like b &H photo video, right? And when I go to B&H photo video, when I look for a lens or I look for a particular light, I typically will sort by most reviews because I don't really care about the one or two people that thought it was a great product that don't know any better and they click the five review button. So sorting by five-star reviews doesn't really tell me anything. Mm -hmm. What I really want to know is what did the ma vast majority of people, what did they land on? And I can do that with camera bodies and I can do that uh, with lenses and I can do that with computers and I can do that with mixers and I can do that with every other device known to man. But the one, the one thing I couldn't do that with is Linux distros. Part of the reason is that evaluating Linux distros is a, very, is a little difficult because it depends on what you're trying to do with that Linux distro. Asking if Red Hat, for example, is a good Linux distro is kind of a silly question. It's like going into a hardware store and saying, I want the best tool. What, which one do you have? Well, what do you want to do? You want to build a house? Do you want to uh, do you want to build a shed? Do you want to build a project with your kids? Each one of those projects, there is a different quote unquote best tool. And so, yeah, if I'm going into an enterprise and I want to manage a server for a university and we get done setting it up and they tell me, hey, this thing just can't go down. What, what should we do? And, and I get to tell them, well, $350 will get you a self-support self Red Hat subscription. You'll get all the updates uh, right from them. It'll be an authorized system. They have an onboarding process. And if you ever do need to upgrade to paid support, there's a, there's a nice easy way to do that just from your Red Hat account. That's a good feature and that's the right tool for that job. But when my son is spinning up Minecraft server in his bedroom, Red Hat isn't the right choice for that. CentOS is much better choice because it offers him the same consistency and, and binary performance that you'd get with Red Hat. So he's developing real world skills, but he's only seven years old. So him being able to do that in his bedroom on a spare computer, it's really nice that we're not paying that $350. And so Linux Delta was a site that was created for the purpose of trying to track Linux changing over time. We have watched as Canonical went from a distro that was Linux for human beings back through a time when, when where they just kind of uh, tapered off and now they've kind of cycled back to it a little bit and you've watched OpenSUSE has been bought and sold I don't know how many different times and yet it's still one of the most highly re reviewed uh, distros on linuxdelta.com and so reading what other people say about a distro and how they're using it and then for what purpose are they using it for an appliance distro are they using it for a server are they using it for IoT and understanding the purpose allows that review to be more accurate so we built a site around that and it's a continual effort because obviously this is I'm funding this stuff out of my pocket and paying for developers time uh, is expensive and so there's been a couple of people that have volunteered to help build parts of the sites and so we're very grateful for that we, we continue to try to collect reviews and community members and we continue to try to build out that infrastructure and so we've recently expanded into matrix now and so we're playing with the matrix infrastructure decentralized communication i think is a fundamental human right and a fundamental component of the web I mean, i've looked at rocket chat mattermost and xmpp and all of the other messaging protocols that are out there and i think the the, the brightest richest future is one's element and the matrix protocol is kind of fleshed out and so as those things become available i mean i could be wrong right so i we can't go at ultra speed and start selling this the clients today, um, but we can certainly host a free instance at matrix.linuxdelta.com and let people sign up and try that and experiment with that and learn what that technology can offer. 
And if in two years or three years, the technology matures to the point that we believe that we can wrap, you know, service around that and sell it to, to clients and support it, then we'll certainly do that. But that's what Linux Delta is about. It's not about any, it's not about any one in particular brand. It's not about one in a particular person. It's about bringing people together to give them the skills and tools that they need to do things in the Linux community, whether that's getting the system set up for themselves or starting a new career or connecting with people or getting into podcasting, whatever it is that people want to do in the open source community. I'm thankful for the opportunity that I have and I want to give back to those people. So for anybody that wants to get involved, anybody that, that has a need and has this project they're passionate about, is, is there a way for folks to contribute back to Linux Delta? Yeah, I mean, everything everything we do is open source, right? Everything we do at AltaSpeed is open source. So we we developed a uh, email bridge. We found some uh, some code that wasn't, I guess, totally ready. I'm not a software developer, and I don't play one on, on TV, but I employ them. And um, <laughs> they tell me that the, the code was not quite ready to go. We paid developers to finish it. And so if you go to, to gitlab.com slash altaspeed technologies, you see the matrix bridge as well as the Linux Delta site. It's all developed out in the open. And so there are plenty of issues. You can look at the issues on, on GitLab. Obviously, we have a Patreon account. You're welcome to support us that way too. The biggest thing that you can do is go to the site and take something away. Find a guide that help you get started. Get connected in Element and ask a question and solve a problem for yourself or solve a problem for your business or, or let us help you in some way. Let us serve you in some way. That would be, that's what I want people to take away from it. We've been getting good feedback on uh, on a segment we introduced not too long ago called Productivity Quarter. And, and no, it's almost like we planned this, but when we decided to do this episode together, I knew exactly what we should feature for today's tip. If there's one struggle that the three of us share, it's that we have kids, significant others, demanding jobs in a challenging field. God forbid we sleep or have hobbies. And we also spend a, a significant amount of our time promoting and advocating for open source. You've had a method that you've followed for as long as I've known you. It's, it's inspired me to restructure the way I plan my week. So why don't you share uh, to the Pseudo Show audience what your philosophy is for time management and making sure to keep your priorities in line? I, uh, I use something called a time budget. And uh, the way that a time budget works is this. I write down, I don't really write, I mean, sublime text, but I, I, I type <laughs> out all of the things that demand my attention. So when somebody says, hey, can you do this project? Can you do this thing? I, I list all those things out. And then I start at the top. There are certain things that have absolute priority in my life. And so I list those things from top to bottom. For me, that starts with God at the top, wife, kids, rest of my family, friends, work, then everything else. And so it allows me to kind of right off the bat, I can say, well, if my wife or my kids need something, those priorities are going to come first. And that, you know, has it led to some uncomfortable conversations when people call and well, if you don't get over here in the next five minutes, we're going to lose a hundred thousand dollars. Yeah. Okay. I have my kids <laughs> such and such of event that I'm going to attend. And as soon as I'm done with that, then I'll get to your hundred thousand dollar problem. Thanks. You know, telling people that nobody wants to hear that. And, and I've had to explain this to a couple of people. That's not me not serving you well. That's me making sure that my family is taken care of before I go to serve you. And so to a certain degree, you have to be willing to say no to people. You have to be willing to tell people that doesn't fit in my schedule. That's not a priority to me right now. I'd love it to be a priority in the future. Maybe we could do, offer some suggestions, those kinds of things. What that allows me to do, though, is when I have a prioritized list of time, I never find myself running out of time for the things I, I for sure want to do. And of course, sometimes things are going to get shuffled today. Is a, is a great example. As we're recording this episode, I'm, I'm right in the middle of an internal work sprint where we're trying to get some of the internal stuff uh, at Ulta Speed done. And I won't leave the office today until all of that work is done. That's not me not prioritizing my wife and my family. They've gotten my attention every other day at a particular time. This time, I've now made an intentional decision not to do that. I'm going to stay and, and, and get work done. And so I think having that, that attitude of understanding where you get fulfillment in life and making sure that you're prioritizing the things that where you get real fulfillment from and telling people that, hey, you know what? I'm just one person. I just can't do everything for everyone. So I'll get back to you on X and then, of course, follow up. But that's how I've kind of dealt with with managing time. It's worked pretty well for me. I mean, I try to budget my time appropriately. So I'm spending, you know, doing the things that matter, family, and then work. Typically, I'm writing tasks, writing down all my tasks I need to accomplish for the day, whether that's family or work, prioritizing it, 
you know, I have kind of have an advantage. A lot of people don't have, I've been working from home for 12 years. Uh, so I have mm -hmm. uh, flexibility that a lot of people don't have. You just need a good way of understanding. There are finite hours in a day. Let me, let me ask you this, Brandon, if I can, did you find it difficult to get, to find motivation when you first started working from home? I, the amount of people I've run into where we've had discussions about the difference between post COVID and pre COVID is trying to find motivation where you're, when you don't have a way to get out of the house and go to a different place to quote unquote, start work. How did you do with that? I've always had a dedicated place to work in my house. So even when I was single, uh, I had a dedicated room in, like when I, in my apartment, I had a two bedroom apartment. I needed another room to do work. That has helped. That has helped a lot. Steady routine. What wake up the same time mm -hmm. every day. Have the the stuff you do in the morning, and that that transitions you into the into a work mode. It doesn't work for everyone. Working from home is not for everyone. Sometimes it is difficult for me to get into the mindset of work, uh, especially now that I have a six year old demanding my attention. <laughs> Hardest boss you've ever tried to please. Yeah, exactly. I mean, or some of the COVID memes out there, just uh, stop calling your uh, your kids kids, but call them coworkers and ends up being very funny stories. <laughs> Even if they're a toddler, toddler is now demanding that I change their, <laughs> my coworker is demanding I, uh, that one, get, that, that one never gets old putting the boundaries in place at home now that I have a family and there are ways of making that setting that up. Like my wife and I have a shared calendar and everything we do, everything that needs to get done around the house, even during the work week is put into that calendar. I know that my daughter has a doctor's appointment. And if my presence is needed, I know to schedule that out of my work day. For me, the biggest adjustment, and, and I've worked from home for years, but especially in the season where all the kids are home and you know my, my partner and I are home, it becomes very crowded, very busy around here. So what, what I've found is I, I have very strict routines that I follow uh, to, to get started for the day. But what I've, what I've learned about myself is not only working from home, but also the type of work that I do gives me some flexibility and some say into my hours, into how I structure my day. There's nothing like struggling through preparing for a presentation for a customer and just your mind isn't there. You've a heavy meeting uh, schedule in the morning and you're just, you just don't have the energy and you can hear your kids are going stir crazy in the next room more times than, than I can count uh, just this summer alone. I, I've taken breaks where I've just set my, I've set my status indicator at work to, you know, away from keyboard gone out. We've taken the kids out to, to a park that's just down the street and we've played on the swings and gone down the slides and, and we all come back feeling better and, and, and energized, and whether it's before dinner or whether it's after the kids go to bed, then I can sign back in having spent that time with, with my family, with, with my kids and rem kind of reminding myself, why am I working this hard? Um, you know, it's for them. And, and taking that time away, having that flexibility keeps me motivated and keeps me from burning out. Do either of you guys have uh, routines or anything that you use to deal with burnout or when you start to feel that lack of motivation? Yeah, I, I know when I'm about at the tipping point. For me, I will just stop, walk away. And typically, I, I, I know. So when I know I'm approaching my burnout point, I take a week off. I just go, all right, I'm done. <laughs> <laughs> It's, it's, it's hard. And sometimes I get to that point and I'm way past it. And that's when I take two weeks off. <laughs> Good for you. Also, are there any openings where you work? <laughs> I want to just schedule two weeks off. I don't know what that's like. Thank you so much for joining us today. As always, your feedback is welcome. Head on over to pseudo.show slash discuss. If you'd like more of our content, you can find it over at pseudo.show and on social media at pseudo show podcast. You can catch more awesome content over at our network partners, Destination Linux network. So Noah, where can people go to get more of the kernel? Destination Linux every week on Sundays, we do that show and then ask Noah show. It's a weekly talk radio show Tuesdays, 6 p.m. Central at asknoahshow.com. So Brandon, anywhere else you'd like to send anybody? 
Now you can follow me at D Brandon Johnson or my website open dash tech.net. And you can follow me at IT Guy Eric or on IT Guy Remember, the pseudo show is your place for all things enterprise open source. Until next time.